session of uh, Open Repositories 2012. Uh, my name is Martin Donnelly. I uh, work at the Digital Curation Centre here at the University of Edinburgh. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this session on deposit, discovery and reuse. Uh, we have three speakers in this session and we need to be quite uh, strict with our time uh, because the developer challenge, which was to be held in Upton Tower Lecture Theatre 1, is now going to be held here uh, at five o'clock, so straight after this session. Uh, uh, the, the, the pill is sweetened somewhat by the fact that there will be drinks available uh, immediately before this. Right. Uh, so those who wish to go out and grab a drink, uh, we'll, we'll aim to finish at f five or ten minutes before five so people can go out, uh, have a comfort break, uh, grab a drink and come back in uh, for five. So uh, without any further ado from me, uh, th I'm going to introduce our first speaker. What we're going to do is we're going to take the questions after each speaker uh, and uh, rather than have them all at the end. Uh, that, that way I think things are fresher on people's minds, etc., etc. So our, our first speaker is Alex Wade uh, from Microsoft um, United Kingdom. Uh, Alex is Director for scholarly, scholarly Communication at Microsoft Research, where he oversees a portfolio of research and researcher-focused collaborations, software products and services. Uh, key amongst these, and this is what Alex is, will be talking about today, is Microsoft Academic Search, which is a free service uh, which helps scholars, scientists, students and other stakeholders quickly and easily find their academic content. Uh, researchers, institutions and activities, so it links it all together. Uh, so I will now hand over to Alex and I'll try and get Thanks, Martin. your, there you go. Brilliant. Okay, thank you for having me here today. Um, as Martin said, I, I am from, from Microsoft, specifically from Microsoft Research. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, Microsoft Research is about a, a thousand people uh, globally within Microsoft who are, have traditionally been focused on advancing the state of the art in, in core computer science. It, it's very much like operating a CS department uh, within Microsoft. In fact, most of the people that we have there are from CS, uh, although we're expanding that out currently into a, a lot of other domains. Uh, we currently have uh, half a dozen uh, large labs worldwide and a, a another handful of smaller technology centers uh, around the world. Um, Yes, I, it does say I'm from Microsoft United Kingdom. I've actually just in the past two months moved back to the US, um, but uh, have been for the past two years at our Cambridge lab. One of the things that we started up within Microsoft Research a few years ago uh, with Tony Hay, who used to be part of the UK science program, is a, a function within Microsoft Research that is really our collaboration arm. There's always been collaboration between our researchers and the academic community. Um, but our group kind of plays a special function in that we actively go out and we seek collaborative projects in e-science, in e-research, uh, things that we think that, that we can bring something to the table uh, in doing. And so, as you might expect, this often involves Microsoft technologies. Um, but increasingly, uh, most of the things that we're producing are, are open source projects. And, and trying to get Microsoft uh, to, to see a little bit more about the, the role that open source software plays in the academic community. As a research organization, we are not a, uh, a revenue generating portion of the company, so everything that we produce, everything I'm gonna talk about today, and I'll talk about three things, uh, are freely available to the community. One way of looking at the, the products that we, uh, with the projects that we work on and the products that we create within our team is to think about how they wrap around the research life cycle. Um, we have a number of projects that, that are, are in each one of these areas right now, but I'm gonna talk about three things today. Uh, Layerscape, which is a platform for data visualization, storytelling, and data sharing, specifically tar targeting the, the geo community. A new project called Data Up. Uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times in the in the conference here in the past couple of days. I think uh, Stephen Abrams yesterday talked about. Uh, it used to be called uh, Data Curation for Excel. If people have heard it under that other name, but I'll talk a little bit about Data Up. And then uh, the main thing I want to discuss is academic search. So Layerscape is a a number of things. Um, really, it's it's about providing desktop tools to people working with geospatial data, allowing them to do real time visualization of their data from an environment that, in in a lot of cases, their data is is already in. So we're starting from where the data exists, and what we've done is created an add-in for uh, for Excel that allows them to drive the data visualization from within the Excel client on their desktop. And this is plumbed from the Excel spreadsheet through this add-in into a rich three-dimensional um, Earth visualization model. 
And as they update the data values in their spreadsheet or as they highlight values in the spreadsheet, they're getting real-time visualization um, within this environment. So you can imagine a spreadsheet that has a combination of fault information and earthquake information. The, the researcher can play around with it, use, use the actual earth model as a way of navigating back to their spreadsheet and using their spreadsheet as a way of driving the model here. But in addition, one of the things that the uh, Layerscape does is that it provides the tooling that allows the researcher not just to have this interactive visualization with their data, but to, to actually create a, a tour, a, a, a fly-through, if you will, of the data that they're talking about. So if in this case somebody's talking about earthquake data, uh, they might be narrating uh, or putting overlay information or visuals uh, onto the map here describing some of the events that went on or if they're talking about uh, receding glaciers, um, having photographs of the actual glacial valley overlaid onto the Earth environment so that you can see the data in the visualized model and see the photographic evidence side by side. And the last thing that it allows people to do is to take those tours and then to share them online. And when you share these things online, they can be browsed by other people, commented on, rated. You can watch these tours as if they are a small three to five minute movie within the browser, but if you actually want to interact with that researcher's data, if you have the rich client installed, you can download the tour, which actually downloads all of that data set with it, into an environment where you can start mashing it up, playing with it, and looking at the underlying data. So that's, that's Layerscape. It's a, it's a free service. It's available now. Um, if you're not running it on Windows and don't have access to the rich client in the Windows environment, uh, there is also a, a web version of it as well, and uh, there's a way to make the, the Excel Excel client talk to that web version. Takeaways, uh, yep, that's what it is. It's a free service, it's all hosted in Windows Azure, and it's a, it's a platform for sharing, finding, and visualizing geo-specific data. We are a small part of, uh, a sm very small contributor to, to uh, some of the efforts that were described yesterday in the larger uh, Data One project. Uh, so just to, to drill in on this one very small entry point, in a, ver in a very similar way to Layerscape, uh, the problem statement as California Digital Library came to us, uh, and also we're in conversations with, uh, with the Moore Foundation as well, is how can we make it very easy from pe for people to go from the data that they have in their spreadsheets into a data repository? And the project as it originally envisioned was very similar to what you just saw with Layerscape in that we wanted to provide the tooling to go from the Excel client directly into a data repository. As we progressed through um, the project though, we wanted to break that dependency on the client for a number of reasons or, or, or allow for other situations without the, the Excel client uh, locally. So the, we expanded the scope of the project a little bit to have both an add-in, something that was plugged into the environment for the researchers to use right there, as well as an HTML5 application that allows researchers just to drag the file into their browser and have that be the, the, uh, the start of the upload action. We're working with uh, both online and offline scenarios where people can gather the data, collect the data when they're online, bring that up and have that seamlessly go out into the repository. And also building this in a, in a repository agnostic point of view. So even though in this first instance, this is being plumbed directly against the Merit repository at CDL, a lot of the, uh, the glue that sticks the, the either the Excel add-in or the HTML5 application together is re repository agnostic and where the repository comes with a number of, of minimum data set requirements or suggested fields that they want to have for the data set that's coming up, that is all passed as part of the, uh, the handshake between the client and the repository, making it easy for you to put another repository in the back end. So I want to give a, a very quick walkthrough uh, uh, of a bunch of slides, one by one, just to show you how, I mean, this is a very simple scenario. This is the, the HTML5 application. Um, User has to sign in. We provide a number of different um, OAuth methods that they can use to, uh, to authenticate against the client. This will be controlled by the repository. Um, you then get a, a little canvas here within the browser, and you can drag your Excel spreadsheet or your CSV file into the target area on the browser. It will then, you can actually grab multiple and, and upload a whole batch of files in one shot if you want to. You then get these in a sort of a, a a local state now. These are your documents where you're going to walk through a small workflow before they go into the repository proper. 
you get the choice of getting the, the files converted um, as you move them into the repository. You provide a minimal set of metadata around the files, and we're looking at ways that we can actually do some automatic metadata extraction from the spreadsheets themselves. Get some citation information, automatically get a DOI or an identifier for the document right there, and you post the document to the repository. And here's where there may be multiple repositories in the back end. You identify the repository that you want to go in, you authenticate against it, and boom, your documents are up in the repository. So that's it. It's very simple. Um, a lot of the, the interesting stuff is in that, that handshake between the repository. Um, this is all an open source project uh, that's being done. Um, all of the requirements gathering, all of the scenarios were being driven by, by the CDL and, and the wider community of people within the Data One project. Um, you can see here some of the re remnants of our previous naming here where it used to be DCXL. Uh, we're in a closed beta right now, both for the Excel add-in and for the web client. And these will all go live uh, hopefully later this summer. So look, look for that. And finally, the thing that I wanted to talk about here was academic search. So this is a project that we've been working on now for a number of years. And it started as a bringing together of several different research projects that were going on within Microsoft Research, both in Asia and in Redmond, about how we can start extracting entity information from unstructured documents on the web. And what this is, is very much a search engine. It's a search engine for academic papers, both harvested now from the web, as well as from institutional repositories and direct feeds that we're getting from, from publishers. So you come in and you do a search, you get back a set of search results, sort of typical thing that you would see in a search engine today. But beyond this just being, I type in a query and I get some results and I click on the results and I'm gone from the site, we're trying to provide a, a bit more analytics around the things that we are indexing and in fact creating new um, aggregations of this data together. So you can click in and see a profile of information around each publication. And this profile may be created from a number of different sources. We may be getting in cross-rep data. We may be pulling in metadata from a repository. We may be getting the full text from a publisher. And we're coalescing all of these things together and pulling some things out. So as we index other full text documents that have cited this, we can pull out some citation context information down at the bottom here. We can aggregate citation patterns over time. Uh, we can pull out some of the keywords from this document and. Uh, and link up uh, to the DOI. If I scroll down on the page here, you'd see some additional things down below, uh, hot links to all of the reference documents within this paper, as well as hot links to all the citing documents within this paper. And you see up at the top, we have here the, uh, the edit button as well. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, all of the entities in our, in our site here have this edit button where we're crowdsourcing uh, additional information around the, the data that we gather here. The other fundamental way that we want to make this service different from, from some of the other services that exist today is that we want to automatically create, we want to make this human-centric, and we want to automatically create the, the profiles of, of information around the researchers that we're gathering together. So this is a re researcher profile page, um, similar graph of citation and publication patterns over time, uh, but we, we can also then pull out other things like the author network. And if you click into that, that button up there, you get some visualizations on the top authors that this person has worked with, or going down the nav bar, the top conferences that they've published in, top journals, et cetera. And then you can aggregate that same data now by institution. So here's a profile page for uh, University of Cambridge. You can see up at the top, uh, this is the aggregation of everybody who has ever been associated with Cambridge. So we're not at the moment time slicing this to everybody who is at Cambridge right now, or only papers that were published by people while they're at Cambridge, uh, which is another way that we're looking at slicing it. But currently, this is, a, this is an all up aggregation. And you can see that in this case, we've got about 150,000 publications. Uh, close to a million citations to those papers. And then we're doing things like calculating an institutional H index. The compare button allows you to uh, pick a domain and then pick two, any two institutions and see how those two institutions compare uh, in their publication patterns over time. And then the, the middle range here is a little bit of a Venn diagram that shows some of the key terms that are extracted from the publication. So in this particular case, I'm looking at uh, atomic and molecular physics in the last five years between MIT and Stanford, and the blue over 
Uh, on this side are the, the key terms that are more specific to MIT's publications, the terms that are more specific to Stanford's, and the areas where they overlap in the middle. We then provide a number of different visualizations. I'm not going to go into any detail on these, but um, play around with the site. This is freely available. It's online. Uh, it's at research. Uh, no, I don't even know the URL. It's at uh, academic.research.microsoft.com. Uh, I'll just show you one here. The academic map allows you to zoom in geographically on the institutions. You can filter by domain here. So if you're looking specifically at, at institutions that are publishing in chemistry, you can apply a filter over there on chemistry. And the dots are just giving a relative size in terms of the number of publications from that institution in our database. The other fundamental difference that we are trying to build with this is to invite people to come in and not just search by keyword, but to explore the data within the database. So if you dr drill down into uh, our very shallow domain hierarchy, you can uh, look at the top authors, the top journals, the top conferences, the top organizations in each one of these domains, and we generate a whole series of these uh, rank lists uh, based on each one of, uh, uh, one of the, the domains. So here and, and the First picture over here, this is biology and chemistry, comparing a list of organizations. You can filter that by continent uh, or the top authors uh, in all years in a, in a subdomain. The other thing that we're doing here uh, with mixed uh, results, mixed acceptance, is that we're actually calculating an in-domain h-index. So you have the all-up h-index for a person, but we calculate an in-domain h-index, which gives an indication, especially for people who are publishing across multiple domains, what the relative influence is of their publications within a specific domain. And as I mentioned before, uh, we are opening up this entire database for editing. Uh, there's a number of different edit functions you can do. Uh, this is not specifically you editing your own record. We invite people to come in and edit any of the records in the system. So you can uh, merge authors together. If we haven't had sufficient information to, to disambiguate and then integrate author records together, you can add new publications either by URL or by BibTeX file. Uh, you can uh, merge publications. If you go into the author view, you get a list of publications and you can say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no for each one of those things and, and give our system uh, more of a, a claims-based view into whether or not that publication is actually uh, assigned to the right author in our system. And that then feeds back into our disambiguation algorithm, so uh, in theory we get better at this over time. Okay. Real quickly here, because I'm running out of time, there's a number of different ways that you can consume the information back out of our system. Everything that I showed you there, the search results, the entity pages, the rank lists, um, all have uh, RSS feeds associated with them. So if you're interested in doing things like tracking when a new citation shows up for a publication, you can do that via the RSS feeds. We have a number of widgets, uh, either in HTML or, or these in, in Silverlight, that we give you the JavaScript code for, and you can embed on your own site and do real-time pulls. Uh, but I want to do a one last just show and tell of something from the repository perspective that you can do today with our, our public API. All of the information in our system is open. Um, you do need to ask for an API key from us, uh, simply because we have a non-commercial restriction on the use of the data within our system. But one of the things you can do, either by pulling uh, the JSON records or a SOAP interface to get XML back, is to essentially um, uh, take a local institutional view of the data that we've got in, in our system. So let me just show you four quick screens here of what the, uh, what the rest, the JSON interface, would give you back. <coughs> so here is a, a pull where, if you just look at the, the URL at the top, um, I'm asking for the object uh, equals authors. So give me all of the authors where the organizational ID is 7306. So I'm saying give me all of the people in our database from uh, University of Edinburgh. And I get back a list here. It will give me their ID. This is a, a truncated record just so I can fit it on the screen here. Um, give me their ID, their name, uh, what research domains they've been in, what their total publication count in the system is and uh, what their total citation count in the system is. And so if I grab one of those records or grab one of those IDs, I can then feed that into the next thing. Give me all of the publications where the author ID equals that. And I get back a list of this person's publications in our system. The title, the other authors who may have been on that paper, what year it was, what journal it was in, how many citations, and the DOI of that record. 
I can now take the ID of one of those records and travel forward and backward through time. So now I've got a publication ID, and I can say for that publication, give me a list of the references in the publication. Who was it, uh, what were the papers that that paper cited? And I pass that in, and that, um, so I'm passing in a publication ID and a reference type, and that's giving me a list of references in the publication, and similarly change the reference type to citation, and these are all the other documents that we have in our system that have cited that publication. So this is a way of sort of traveling backwards and forward, pulling data out of our system, and uh, have a play with it. Send us an email if you want to get an app ID. So that is it. I invite you to, to use our system, follow us on, on Twitter, uh, request an app ID, come and edit your record and, and play around. And uh, thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Alex. Now, we, we have a roving mic for questions, and I'm going to ask two things of you if you have a question. One is to wait for the roving mic to come to you before you begin. Uh, and the second is to state who you are and your affiliation, if, if you could, please. So questions for Alex. One down here, thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Fletcher. I am a fellow with the Shuttleworth Foundation, so that's my affiliation. My question is about the data app. What are you using as the protocol to actually push into the repositories? That's a good question that I can't answer for you. I know that we, we have looked at uh, SWORD for doing this. I don't know if SWORD is what is supported in the Merit repository. Mm -hmm. So. We're, we're, as I said, we're doing the, a lot of this um, merit specific at the moment, so we may be using a, a merit protocol for that. But like I said, all of these things have been modularized, and so we're, we, had, we have SWORD in the spec, and if SWORD isn't implemented right now, it, it's, it's slotted to be there. Question behind this gentleman. Um, Andrew Mwesigwa from Makere University Library, Uganda. I just wanted to find out, does Microsoft Academic Search harvest from all repositories worldwide? We are uh, willing to. That's a, the that's a direction that we want to go. Um, we're actually looking first at aggregations. Uh, so we're right now in the process of ingesting all of the OCLC Oyster uh, repository data. I think there's about 22 million records in that system right now. Uh, we want to get to the point where we actually provide a self-service mechanism where you can come. A lot of this is discoverable. And if your content is being indexed by for example, the, the larger Bing engine, we can actually scrape out of their index and add these things into ours. Uh, but we want to pro provide a registration form that would allow repositories to give us an OAI PMH endpoint at some point so that we can come and get more direct and more up-to-date access to your repositories. So the answer is, right now, probably only in a cursory manner. Eventually, we'll get to a more complete version of that. Okay, so what, one final question. Just Oh, sorry, well, well two more questions, you, you and you. So thanks. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> you um, can keep it uh, brief, please. Alex Maslow from uh, Texas A&M University, U.S. I just had a quick question about how the domain hierarchy is generated. Is it just automatically generated? Is it manual generated, it's pulling from keywords? How is that built? <clears throat> so we have two different things. We've got the, the domain hierarchy, and that is manually uh, generated. We, we started eff effectively with the top-level ISI categories, and we've worked with a number of subdomains to define them. Um, it's actually... Uh, uh, an area of debate for us right now. We'd very much like to go to, to an automated system, and we've talked with a number of researchers who've come up with methods for doing that. The challenge that we have is if we make that much more dynamic, it, it starts to make the notion of rank lists and comparati comparisons over time uh, a little bit more um, interesting to, to sort of figure out. So I, I think that that's probably the direction that we're gonna go. So it is a manual, manually curated list of categories. It's two levels deep. There's a top level and second level, so there's about 200, roughly, uh, categories. And there, there's already challenges about how we do categorization, because we only categorize at the categorize at the journal level rather than at the article level. OK, and we've got time for one final question from the gentleman in back. Uh, David Palmer, University of Hong Kong. Um, other search engine engines have left OAI PMH because it was too difficult. Uh, Microsoft belongs to schema.org. Yeah. Um, um, does the, micro, the academic search, do they rec recommend us to use a certain type of metadata in our repositories? We are working through the answer to that question. So we, we support OAI PMH today. Um, we are not yet at the point where we've seen a huge enough uptake in schema.org annotation 
for us to make the switch over to that. Um, it's, it, it, and to be honest with you, I haven't sat down and done the full analysis of whether or not all the data that we would want to have comes in via schema.org. So I imagine that this is gonna be a, a long-term conversation uh, about what the, what the best match is. Okay, thanks. Well, um, unfortunately, we are pressed for time, so I have to leave it there. But if we can express our thanks to Alex once more. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. If, if you could. So, uh, our next speaker is uh, moving swiftly on to Steve Hitchcock from the University of Southampton, who will be talking about enhancing and testing repository deposit interfaces. I'll just help Steve get set up. Uh, so, Steve is the project manager for the JISC Deposit MO and uh, its uh, imminent uh, successor, which would be called Deposit MO -er, or Deposit More. Uh, Steve was also the project manager of the Keep It project, uh, project which is how I know him. Um, now, Steve has worked at the University of Southampton on a number of projects uh, about the digital information lifecycle, from open access using repositories to digital preservation, uh, and he's also involved in a project to support institutional research data management. Uh, at his university, which is a, a hot topic among the UK's uh, HEI. So, over to you, Steve. Okay, thank you, Martin. Can everybody hear? Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if I were a television programme, I'd quite like to be scheduled uh, to follow something like X Factor rather than, say, Newsnight. And following Alex and Microsoft, I feel perhaps we have been given that slot here this afternoon in the context of open repositories. <laughs> So I better move on quickly before people realize that it's time to switch over. Um, brief summary of what I'm going to talk about. Um, institutional repositories, particularly open access repositories, face great challenges. Perhaps their greatest challenges are to follow. Um, the greatest challenges they've yet faced in their relatively short lifetimes. One response to that might be to uh, think about how you present a range of services, how you increase the range of services that you offer to your users. In particular, you might think about uh, how you can improve the presentation of the repository to those users who deposit content. That's the issue that we've been tackling in the Deposit MO project. The MO stands for changing the modus operandi for repository deposit. I mean, it's really obvious, isn't it? And what we've been doing in that is to investigate how we can reposition the process of deposit within the user workflow. So this isn't about DSpace or ePrints or where it fits in the repository. It's about fitting in to the user's workflow. And the reason we can think about it in this way is because we have SWORD, and more recently we have SWORD 2. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with SWORD. You've probably used it, you've seen examples of it. What I want to do in this presentation is show how you can um, reimagine SWORD and put it to um, some, some new uses. In addition, we've done some user testing of the tools that we've created, and I'll give you a brief insight into the results that they've produced. And um, we'll talk about this new project, Deposit More, um, and think about how we can move on to increasing, using the tools to increase the number of deposits in our repositories. So I usually put the credits at the very end of my presentation. What I find is that I stop talking and somebody switches the slides off and people don't get a chance to see who contributed to the project. Now, you might think that my role seems rather menial there, but when you're working with a talented team, um, I think it's important that you take care about what you sweep up. And it, if you look very carefully in the sweepings, you might find some interesting um, results. And in my case, that has led to a presentation. <laughs> so what are the challenges, the immediate challenges, that institutional repositories are going to face? Well, you've probably come across very recently the Finch Report on open access or sustainable access, as they like to call it. For the very reasonable sum of about 50 to 60 million pounds, that's per year for a transitional period, in addition to the existing costs of subscribing uh, through your library to all the journals that you may currently need, the Finch Committee has agreed, in collaboration with the publishers, that they will provide open access to their content. 
and thereby make institutional open access repositories obsolete. However, they have conceded that there is a role for those repositories in collecting research data and preserving content. Now, we've heard lots of presentations about those areas of research, those areas of using repositories, and they are perfectly valid. I'm involved in a project there myself. But I think repositories want to take a bigger view. We're thinking about how we connect research data, research information, but also the publications. We don't want to see those hived off, even if they're open access, to another controlled environment. Now, if the Finch Committee is uh, an expensive uh, attack on your right flank, then innovative open access uh, enterprises, one of which I've picked out here, PJ, which hasn't yet started, they're tackling your left flank and trying to offer very low-cost open access solutions. In neither case do we know the outcome, but I think you, if, if you're involved in repositories, you can begin to anticipate how that might affect you. So we want to do something about that. We want to respond in the way that we provide services to users, as I said. Now, Deposit MO has been to Edinburgh before. That was a year ago at the repository fringe. Now, the bad news for you is that I'm not Dave Tarrant, and I'm not going to be giving uh, a live demonstration of how you can deposit content with Microsoft Connect and waving your hands around um, in front of a screen. But if you want to see that demonstration, it's available to you. Deposit MO has also been to OR before. Uh, it, it was presented originally at OR 2010 in Madrid. Uh, that was just before we began the project. So that outlined the, the vision that, um, uh, that, that lay behind what we were doing. And I need to get this off my chest as well, because before the paper was accepted, we were told by the organisers that this was a borderline paper. And it turns out that it may have been borderline because they didn't have all the referees' comments. But we weren't told that at that particular moment. And it made me think... Why is it borderline? And I remembered that I'd included this particular uh, sentence, which I hadn't properly justified. I hadn't included a reference for. And of course, it could be somewhat contentious. People who develop repositories might think, well, I've done plenty of testing on my repository. But my real point is that uh, there has not been a lot of published user testing data of repository interfaces. And if you want to, um, if you want to argue with that particular point, uh, I now have a reference for you to read before arguing the point um, based on our uh, project blog. So there's something you'll be familiar with. Uh, it's uh, part of the ePrints deposit interface. I'm only showing it as a refresher. There's another interface. This is SWORD. And I've just picked this out. There are a whole number of SWORD client interfaces and this is one that was developed for Facebook. The reason I'm showing it here is simply that, to all intents and purposes, superficially, you might think, well, it looks rather like the ePrints interface in the sense that it's a web form. It contains a number of fields that expect you to key in some text and ultimately to submit uh, a digital object. And that SWORD interface really reflects uh, the first stage of SWORD. So it's useful because you can abstract the deposit interface from the actual repository itself, and that frees you up from the point of deposit and then it enables you to deposit um, different types of content in different repositories. Now, with SWORD 2, which was released just earlier this year, um, you can add, although with SWORD 1, you can only deposit um, and then not really do anything with the thing that you've deposited. With SWORD 2, you now add um, update and delete functions. And this open, it gives, you, gives you much greater scope for more interactivity between the user and the repository itself. If you want to use SWORD 2, it's now built into the current versions of ePrints and DSpace, and to some, to some extent, this was achieved through the Deposit MO project as well. There are some extensions to the native 
uh, SORD protocols, uh, which have been implemented for both repositories through the project. I'm not going to talk about those here, but they again enable a little extra functionality that may be uh, adopted by subsequent uh, versions of SORD 2. So here's another deposit uh, point using SORD. It doesn't look anything like the previous two examples that we just saw, because now we're working within the space of uh, an authoring environment. In this case, within Word. And we've called it the word add-in. Well, if you uh, were listening to, to Alex just now, you'll have seen this phrase appear in his talk as well. Because what Microsoft does with its Office tools is provide APIs so that you can write code to interface and act, um, add functionality and act with these applications. So um, through the project, we created a piece of code that you can uh, download and install. It works with uh, Windows 7 and Word 2010. And if you install it, what it does is it adds, you can just about see it in the, uh, the top uh, line of the, the ribbon, Deposit MO 2010, it gives you a tab, which if you open, open that tab, gives you the option to either display or not display the box that you see on the right-hand side. This now begins to look like a deposit form again, but actually it's a much reduced version of a deposit form. Really, it's asking you to provide a login to your chosen repository. Then it provides function buttons that allow you to uh, submit and, uh, and or update the content that you're creating. And that box, the, uh, the empty box, is a way uh, of um, provide, or, or the, below that is, is a way of providing some interaction, some feedback from the repository as you deposit your content. And you can judge whether your deposit has been successful or not. So you can see by, the, in, in this, through this process, you can take the, um, the originator as an author, and instead of competing with uh, the publishing process at the end of, or the completion of the object, the author can begin to save the object within the repository as it's being worked upon. This is another example of uh, an in-app based deposit process, again, based on SWORD, again using some specific code that is developed and available from our project pages. You can see this one, this one a little bit uh, more visually. So you take, in this case, a collection of images uh, that you'll find in your Windows Explorer, and you drag your image to a particular folder. We call it a watch folder. The script that was created is watching that particular folder and um, waiting for things to be dropped into it. As that content is dropped into the folder, it then appears automatically. If you refresh your repository, um, you'll see it appear in your repository as, as a new record or as an update to an existing record. So this, again, is a nice process where um, it looks like we can serve the user, can serve, serve the author um, and more creatively uh, and to enable them to get content into a reposit repository more easily than they have been up to now. So you may be thinking, this looks rather like some other things that I've come across. Um, a Dropbox comes to mind. Uh, Microsoft SkyDrive, for example, a cloud service in which they recently announced uh, that, like the example I just gave, would be integrated into Windows Explorer or, in this case, Apple Finder. In other words, just drag and drop content from your hard drive into the storage service that they provide. As simple as that. We need to be a little bit careful here, though, because repositories were not designed as storage devices in the way that Dropbox and SkyDrive are. Repositories are still essentially curation and presentation services. So when you contribute, when you deposit in a repository, you're effectively on a fast path to presentation. What we're doing in Deposit MO is using something of a hack, really, to um, avoid getting to that process of presentation and publication as soon as you might otherwise wa want to or, or, or have to. And using this, what we might call save for later device, if you've used uh, a repository deposit form, you'll know there's a fill in the form, save for later, don't necessarily publish straight away. That's effectively what we're doing with these, um, these approaches to improving repository deposit. But we really need a new paradigm. If we're thinking about repositories as 
uh, drag and drop storage spaces in the same context as these services, we need a new paradigm for repositories. And while we're thinking about that, perhaps we might think about some of the issues that Cameron Nayland raised in his keynote yesterday, which were that perhaps we need to think about um, collaborative spaces as well. How would you facilitate collaborations like the Gower's mathematical proof or the Galaxy Zoo example that, that Cameron showed yesterday? So as we say, we've done some, uh, some real user tests. Um, I know Dave Tarrant got some uh, spontaneous applause for his uh, presentation at Edinburgh, but I've never come across a presentation that got uh, <laughs> spontaneous applause that discussed the issue of user tests. So what we did was we um, set up some laptops running the services that we created. And our invited users use these services, um, most often working in pairs. So it's, when you're doing user tests, it's really important that you know exactly what it is you're testing. And in this case, we were testing the process of using the tools. We weren't testing uh, the download, the installation, and setup of the tools. And there's a, there's a good reason for that, which is that perhaps these tools are not going to be the ultimate tools you would want to use, but they may well be pointers to the kinds of tools you would want to, to create in the future. But you do want to know about the process and how usefully it serves um, the process of improving the user experience of depositing in the repository. The reason we put users in pairs is that when you're running observed user tests, if they're working individually, you have no real means of interacting with them. As pairs, they talk to each other. You start to learn their immediate reactions to the process that they're engaged with. And we had a number of ways of measuring the outcomes of these tests, which were um, the observer notes, and that would include some of the things that users might say, questionnaires that the users completed before and after, and in particular, um, the task completion times and the success rate of completing the tasks. And in order to measure that, we have very extensive records, which are essentially the repository records of the user's uh, work time, which is an interesting uh, research data management case on its own. So among the results that we've documented extensively on our blog, one that really stands out is that both the Word tool and the Explorer drag and drop deposit tool seem to enable us to improve the deposit time. This isn't the only result we've produced, but it is a striking one, but it doesn't come without caveats. Essentially, what you're doing when you're using these tools is depositing data without necessarily documenting it to the extent that current repository interfaces require you to do. And that may well be the reason for the time saving. An overall summary of the findings might be that although there's a wow factor initially, when people first experience the service that we're offering, drag and drop, saving word, it seems like something they haven't experienced before but works very well in, 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 in principle. Their, their anxiety levels begin to increase the more content they have to deposit. So in our deposit test, what we did was we asked them to deposit, we gave them some content to deposit. So the first thing was a Word document, the second thing was an image. The third thing was a PDF that we ask them to deposit using the native repository interface. And then beyond that, we gave them some more content and said, use whichever tool you want, but we want you to do certain things with this, such as update a document, create a collection. So in other words, there was a sequential process as users were creating or building bigger collections mm -hmm. using the content that we provided, the anxiety level started to go up as they began to realize that although they could start to do things very quickly, they weren't necessarily sure what they had done. They needed sometimes to retrace their steps and work out um, what was where. Sometimes they put things in the wrong place, sometimes they deposited in the wrong folders, um, and they needed to retrace those steps. 
the way they need the, the way they wanted to be able to do that was quite often to have some trail or to have some uh, metadata after all we haven't got as much metadata as we usually do to locate the items they deposited and then to work out where they should have gone now on the metadata point you may well be thinking um, well there's really not much advantage if you've saved some time but not got any metadata um, it might not be a service that I think very highly of because I don't believe that we should be excluding metadata from uh, de deposit and of course mostly that would be the case but there are some examples where we aren't any longer creating metadata at least at the point the initial point of deposit one of which we heard yesterday that's the Library of Congress Twitter archive where it rather surprised me to hear that they don't have any metadata for the individual entries. Now, it might seem obvious why they don't, but is that a particular, particularly special case? Um, this is another example. This is from the uh, Dataflow project at Oxford. Uh, you've probably heard about it um, in other presentations here. What I particularly like about this project is that it represents the two motivations for people to want to uh, the two motivations for people to put things in a repository the first is they want to that's because they have a reason to they feel the services that the repository offers are things that they want to make use of and the second is they have to and that's usually driven by policy and this architecture of data flow represents both of those the first stage data stage is a simple, again, drag and drop approach, not necessarily using the same mechanism that we've used here, but in principle it is very similar. It doesn't require the user to upload or create a lot of metadata. It just says to them, if you want to put something in this storage space, just drag it here. You can document it as you wish. Now, if you want to then take advantage of a data bank repository where things are curated uh, on a service basis by the Digital Library Group at Oxford, then they start to require more documentation and that's when people can start to add uh, metadata through SORD and, uh, uh, and, and, and packaging up the object to move it into data bank. Now what user tests don't tell you is whether um, that process of improving the experience of deposit will increase the, the, the number of deposits you achieve. User testing can't tell you that so we're beginning a new project to answer that question that's deposit mode to deposit more. And I think finally we have a name for a project that people can probably understand. Uh, when we first wrote this paper back in February, we were just about to submit that proposal to JISC, um, and we just heard from JISC that the proposal has been accepted. So uh, as far as uh, our partners in this project are concerned, I've been telling them the good news this week, and they've been somewhat surprised because it's been, t it's been rather a longer process than we thought. Um, and they, their reaction seemed to me to be uh, along the lines of they really thought we were the dead parrot, but we've um, defied convention. And in Deposit More, um, we want to find out, uh, in working with real repositories, whether the tools that we've created uh, enable more content to be deposited. We'll be using statistical tracker tools to try and work out if that's the case. The tools we'll be investigating are the watch folder, which I've described, Easy Chair, a new tool which I haven't, but which I essentially identifies papers from your institution within the Easy Chair uh, database and gives you a one-click download to your repository. We're not necessarily looking at Word because uh, that's a creative process and won't give us results within the short time frame of the project. So essentially, we need to reconceptualize the service that we call deposit. We need to enable people to deposit more. We have more types of deposit uh, likely to come in our direction. Research data is a particular example. But it's not just different types of data that we have to accept. It's new workflows that we have to accommodate. Um, I think what this project demonstrates is that there are ways of accommodating all of these new needs and in facing down the challenges that are being posed by publishers and research committees that believe open access um, can be provided by s services other than repositories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, we've got
got a couple of minutes for questions, and uh, David here has the roving mic, so first question for Steve. No questions forthcoming at the moment. I've got a question for Steve. Um, you, you've clearly done lots of user testing on uh, you, you know, how people use the tools, etc. Has that extended to why people use the tools? Their uh, motivations for deposit, be that allied to, uh, let's say, a mandate, an institutional mandate, or towards uh, institutional research assessment exercise, ref submissions, that sort of thing? No, as I say, we didn't really extend in that direction. What we were trying to do was to work with teams of uh, with uh, teams of users, test users, through the uh, partners in the project, um, and it was really quite a specific uh, test in the sense that we wanted just to run the services that we created and find out how they did that. Um, there was, a, I think, some comment in response to the paper that we've uh, that we've written here that wondered if we could do more, whether we had enough data about those users. And I think you're coming from the same direction. Um, yes, probably if we were to redo those tests, we might want to find out more about the users themselves and more about their motivations. In fact, what we, tend to, what, what, what we really found out in that process was whether they were experienced or novice users. Um, so we found out um, that there was a mix of those, and I think that's a reasonable target audience because um, I think repositories are should be on a growth phase, in a growth phase, and therefore extending to more types of user. So the services that we're trying to provide, I think, will be aimed at both types of user. I don't think they're particularly aimed at experienced uh, users alone. Um, but we don't really know uh, whether mandates are, are bringing more people to yeah. repositories either. The, the, the reason why I asked was about uh, the quality of the metadata, which was an issue that you addressed. And if, if people are obliged to do things, then they may do it begrudgingly and the, the metadata suffers in that respect. Well, interestingly, we had um, users, as I say, from different partner teams, one of which was the library uh, repository. So mm -hmm. the administrators of the library were among our test users, and it was quite clear that they were very interested in the metadata process, and therefore they highlighted flaws, perhaps more so than some of the research uh, test users did, in the limitations of the metadata provision sure. using the new tools. And um, what you found as well, that they more naturally reverted to the native uh, deposit interface, um, those users from the library. OK. Any other questions for Steve? Yes, we've got Cathy. Hi, Cathy Fletcher again. Um, so you, you said you identified this problem that users had if they were depositing a lot of things, keeping track of where they actually ended up. Did you figure out ways to to help them navigate and keep track of their deposits that you're going to build in in the next phases? Um, I think the question resolves, as I just said, to, to uh, whether we can persuade people not to revert to the native interface. You're quite right. Um, we need to find ways in which we can keep people within the, uh, the new environments that we've created. There, are, there, is, meta there is provision for uh, adding metadata. In the, in the case of Word, for example, um, metadata is added automatically from the deposit itself, particularly if it's in, say, a docx format. In the case of the image deposit, then that's slightly more problematic because you have to describe what it is you've, you've got in the image. And there is a metadata uh, creation tool um, but it wasn't necessarily the most polished of most polished parts of the, the, the um, service. I think in addition, I think you're quite right that there needs to be a trail. People need to understand the trail of, of, of deposit in the sense of where something is. It's not just about the documentation, but it is where they've put it. Because when they made mistakes, um, it wasn't necessarily obvious how they were going to retrieve those mistakes. And that clearly is an issue from a user testing point of view for feeding back into the uh, further development process. And, and perhaps I can add to that. Sorry, I'm Dave Tarrant also on the, on the project. That there's One of the major problems is unlike things like Dropbox and SkyDrive, the repository, once you submit something and say, this is the version that I want to submit and to be published in the repository, the repository takes control of that object. So the user loses control of that object. And the repository will often do things like make that object with other things, automatically put in metadata. So if you're doing this sort of in the user's environment on their desktop, suddenly something else is doing something, right? Because you've got the deposit workflow there interfering with this process. So the user kind of loses a little bit of control. So it, that turns to phase them a little bit. 
So you have to be very careful about what you're actually presenting back about what the repository is doing to the object. So that, that, that does become a problem when you try and merge these two paradigms. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. And uh, we're going to have to end those questions there. So another round of applause, please. Final speaker uh, in this session is Cathy Fletcher, uh, from uh, who's a Shuttleworth Foundation fellow. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, I have to confess, I had to look up the Shuttleworth Foundation as it was new to me. And what I learned is that the Shuttleworth Foundation uh, provides funding for dynamic leaders who are at the forefront of social change. So no pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, in addition to Cathy's fellowship, the, the purpose of the fellowship is to foster an ecosystem of tools around open education. Uh, Cathy has also been the project manager and technical director for Connections, uh, which is part of the open education ecosystem in its own right. Uh, Cathy's background is in computer science and she has interests uh, including and not limited to software usability, uh, learning methods and technology and web enhanced education. And I will now hand over to Cathy. Thank you. So um, my talk today is about um, a sword, sword implementation and client and um, the SOAR, a, a SWORD extension called OER Pub to make SWORD really useful for depositing remixable open education resources. That's my background, but you've already heard that. Um, my colleague Marvin Reimer is also here who's done a lot of the programming that I'm talking about. He actually started um, last year with Connections as a Google Summer of Code student. So that also will give you some framework for the timeline that we have uh, done. Um, I actually attended a workshop at Open Repositories last year in Austin because I was looking for an API for deposit and since then all of this work has occurred. So it was, you know, thank you to this conference that we found something quite useful for our needs. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, uh, un we are a little different than the academic institutional repositories in that we are targeting remixable open education repositories and um, some of these repositories really are multi-institution like Connections in particular, one that I have a lot of background with, is completely open. Anyone can publish there. Um, there are also you know, big institutions that are publishing lots of content within Connections and they have their own lenses onto their content. And of course all of the OCW, um, open, open Universities Lab Space, which is again targeting end user content that is contributed. One of the things, one of the reasons why we care about remixability is that if you can get content into remixable formats, then you have these, you have really powerful tools that you can use to generate distribution of these, these um, resources in lots of different formats, and that can all be done automatically. So you get a ton of power from that. Um, we can also empower a developer community around all of these open resources that can create new and innovative things from them. Again, if we can make them remixable, then other people can figure out great authoring solutions and creation solutions. People can build learning, uh, machine learning kinds of algorithms using this content. Um, and we can encourage lots of the, these open institutions to to create their materials in, in remixable ways. So there are a couple of things about remixability, however, that are hard to support. Um, there are kind of two things. One comes directly from my experience working with Connections, and I don't think Connections is unique in this. Connections had grand visions, really, really interesting project, but really didn't produce a lot of open APIs for anybody else to work with it. So it was very hard to grow the developer community around this, this project because there weren't easy ways to get involved. So my fellowship is about making it easier for developers to get involved in open education processes by providing APIs. That's what brought me to Open Repositories last year to the SWORD workshop that Richard Jones and Stuart Lewis gave. And then the other thing is that when you make something remixable, it's a harder authoring job. You're not allowing, you, you want to get documents that don't have a lot of crazy presentation stuff mixed in with them because that makes them very hard to mix together. If I take a, my Word document and your PDF and try to put them together, I'm going to have a hard time doing that. 
So, so those are the two things that I've been focusing on. Um, I'm not going to read this slide to you, but uh, you know, in, in looking at the whole space of what kind of APIs you need in, in open education resources, you obviously need a lot of APIs about discoverability. There are other people working on that, and I'm listing some of the different kinds of things that, that are interesting in this area, metadata discovery and the format that you actually make documents in that have structure that's reusable. So in particular, what I'm talking about today is closing the loop. So a lot of these remixable repositories, you can get the content. It's open. It's freely available. You can get the URL to get it. A lot of them do you know, produce OAI, PMH uh, discovery mechanisms. But if you want to publish back, you're going to need to go to that particular repository and use their user interface and sit there, you know, and, and, and you're not going to have ways of publishing from, from outside the repository. That's where SWORD comes in, and what we did was look at SWORD version 2 and figure out what else did we need in order to do this for open education resources. And we were, I was looking very specifically at connections because that's where I came from. It's not designed to be just a connections thing. But um, that was a, a, it gave us a real challenge, like a real thing that we wanted to, to accomplish and um, looking at the connections model. So again, this, this presentation is available. And I, um, I'll give the tiny URL to the presentation so that you could, if you wanted to look at the specification itself, these are um, right now stored in public Google Docs. And there is a general specification and then a reference implementation that Connections did and that refer reference implementation which we just we took this SWORD spec itself and then we added in things that were repository specific and we used that to hire the contractors that built the SWORD service and it was incredibly successful so um, it was a nice thing to, to, to build off of. So why did why did I go to this workshop, and why did we pick SWORD version 2 for our deposit API that we were doing? And really, the main thing is that it had support for workflow. And this is really important for the kinds of things that we're targeting. You have, you're not just depositing something. You are, you are a part of an editing process. That's a live object. It continues to be edited over time. It continues to be versioned. Those versions are permanent, so that if I create a fantastic resource and you use it and then I change it, you can still count on the version you were using. Um, there's also this, this concept that open education is trying to really push, which is having people adapt, translate, and derive copies of content. So even if you don't know me personally and you're not going to edit the copy that I have, making it possible to do these derived copies. So the, the uh, workflow that's in SWORD version 2 really helped with, with making that work. And then, you know, other nice things is that it's already based on a very, very common API. And I'm very sensitive to making sure that we're, we're not reinventing anything we don't have to. Um, they had the recommendation to use Dublin Core, which is very simple, and lots of people support it. And it's very flexible about what the packaging contents are, which is really necessary because repositories have different things that they're expecting to have. Okay, So briefly, I'm going to tell you um, the kinds of things that we extended. And um, our intention is definitely that the, it's completely still compatible with SWORD version 2. So it is intended to be um, not to have changed SWORD, SWORD v2, this, these uh, extensions. And um, Stuart Lewis did help us as we were defining the APIs to make sure we did a good job. Now the real test is we need somebody else to implement it. Um, and we uh, had a brief workshop at the beginning of this about um, doing deposit to an open repository like Connections and to your institutional D space at the same time. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of those multi-deposit use cases that come up even in the open education world. So, so we did a little clarification of metadata. Dublin Core has ways of specifying versions of things, but we needed to be able to distinguish between what's a new version and what's a derived copy. And so we just, we just kind of arbitrarily made this, this specification that 
version is is version of and the parent source for a derived copy uses the source field. Uh, we did add in licensing workflows, so for places that are get, you're depositing to, but you're going to have to go do some lic signing licenses and getting author agreement, those kinds of things, we put that workflow in that. We did all those as namespaced attributes on the current SORD elements and, and Dublin Core elements. And then we did a bunch of documentation, which I'm hoping is just a model for other repositories that, uh, that implement this. Like, if I don't give you an, uh, uh, a piece of metadata, what are the default values, and making sure that that's really easy and it's right there in the specification so you can find that out. Are there certain pieces of the metadata that the repository controls itself? You can't set the creation date or whatever. Um, we define those. And then we also realize that there are different places that you can find metadata within the packaging. It's in atom entry itself, like you have title in atom entry. You also have the Dublin Core that's recommended and possibly the resource that you're depositing also has metadata. So we just made the, the precedents clear. Um, we did this ex extension of how do I, if I have a public resource in this repository and I want to edit a copy of that, how do I specify that to the sword endpoint? That I want to do version two of what's, ex what's already existing out there, or I want to take your document and I want to make a derived copy. So we're still using the, the Dublin Core metadata to do that, and we just made a definition of here's how you do it. Um, this came directly from Connections. We needed a way, and this is really just convenience. Again, some repositories doesn't have to implement this, but it was very helpful for us to have this in the service that we implemented, which is a form of merge semantics. So put would, def would delete, you know, would um, replace everything in a piece of content, or you have uh, the option of deleting and starting again. But there's some th simple things that people tend to do, and we wanted to make them efficient. So we defined this merge semantics, which is just a header. And it changes slightly the behavior that happens on put. But if you don't use the header, everything's fine. And if your repository doesn't know what to do with that, it can ignore it. Um, in the specification, we added a section on transforms under the packaging section and put a lot of repository-specific documentation and recommendations within the, the general spec, we just put recommendations that if your repository is going to transform content in a certain way, here's where you're going to explain how all that works. Here's where you're going to explain what all the packaging looks like for your repository. And we added some errors, and some of these we thought up ourselves, and some of them was as we were building the service and testing it, we realized we needed to know what had gone wrong. So we added some errors that are specializations of the existing errors, um, having a lot of them having to do with permissions, um, being able to tell whether a transform failed or the deposit itself failed. Those are the kinds of things that we added. So then um, we implemented the service within Connections. So this was the first ever ability to deposit to Connections from outside Connections. And um, Connections is interesting because it is available for anybody in the world to use. And it supports both c carefully controlled versions of content and this idea of derived copies. So it'll keep track of that for you and let people use that. So it was an interesting first case for us. Lessons learned. The detail in the specification was great. It was really nice to have somebody else's specification to just model it completely on. It, it worked very, very well for us. Um, we did, in our metadata, specify multiple ways on a couple of things that we, we found every single one of those through, through bug, bug fixes. So um, I now know that we should have just said, this is the only way to do it. <laughs> do it that way. Um, we, uh, we are going to uh, uh, change the, the service implementation to make the SWORD treatment parsable. Um, we have a lot of information coming back in that SWORD treatment, and we're just doing it as a text string, and that's not good. Um, we always want the deposit receipt. So SWORD was said, you know, here's, you have to send it here, but you don't have to send it there. We really needed it back so we could tell these various error conditions what was going on. 
And then um, in the system we were using, you know, you have these public URLs which anybody can, can find off the web. The editing system, however, has a completely different set of URLs, and the SWORD system itself has yet another set of URLs. And so um, I know that the SWORD group made a suggestion that you put this, the endpoints for each document in the document itself in its public view, but we in particular didn't have control over that, and so we couldn't put it there. So um, I've made a suggestion for a way to set to have an additional now this would change you know this is an additional uh, requirement that a sword service be able to answer a question about give me the edit URLs for this particular public URL so it's something for other people to take a look at so then we have we built a client to go with this service and the client is really a transform tool so it takes documents in any form that people have started out with writing, transforms them into this remixable format that Connections exports, accepts, and also translates them into a very clean HTML. And then it uses the SORT API that we implemented to deposit it to Connections, and then Connections builds all of these formats for you from that. So you do the deposit and you get PDF, EPUB, um, a web view, a downloadable web view, all of a mobile view, you get all of that automatically from that initial deposit. And um, just a little bit about the, uh, the client and why it's significant. Um, what, we, what we were really after, this, this again is you know, one of the things we were really trying to, we were trying to make it much easier for authors to create this remixable education content. So our, um, our client will take documents in Word, convert them to this remixable format. So again, what I'm trying to illustrate in this set of slides that I'm going through is that I've taken somebody's Word document and I've created a, a uniform HTML version and then behind this is also this XML version that's being published to Connections. And you can see this is uh, a document from the web. And again, this is all this is really a lot of, it, it's some work that started out in connections that we adapted, and also a lot of work from um, Marvin and his Google Summer of Code project and then additional work since then. So this is the set, this uh, web, web content remixed, and this is a Google Doc. It doesn't actually fit in my example very well because I'm trying to build a biology textbook, but anyway, again, that Google Doc is now in this same format, and that's the client, you know, just works with Google using OAuth and Google's tools to do this. Um, another web document <coughs> converted, and now just, you know, you describe your metadata. That's the metadata that we're going to package up using SWORD, and then you see the finished upload to connections. That's the last step, absolutely using OER pub SWORD, and um, the deposit receipt has come back and we parsed it and found out that you still need to sign the license before this can actually be published. And that's brought back to the, to the author who needs to go do that at Connections for various legal reasons. And then, here it is published in Connections. We have our college biology textbook with all these different sources and they're all uniform. And, um, I uh, also wanted to talk about that, that goal of getting developers into the community faster. So again, since I, I was with Connections for four years and we did really try to bring people in and it might take six months to get somebody completely up to speed to where they felt like they could contribute. Um, we did a sprint this February uh, that Marvin led and um, we got three new developers fixing three bugs in the client software in a day, and it took them maybe two hours to get started. So we were really excited about the enabling technology that allow us to, to get people involved in this project much faster. So, and other current uses of, so one of the interesting things is, you know, I really pushed this SWORD implementation 
for my own goals, which were to build this client authoring tool, which we're now building an editor for. A real, so once you've converted your documents, you'll be able to continue editing them and then publish them. Um, but it's proven quite useful for connections too, so they've been using it since then. Um, they had a big project with Open Course Library, which is um, a Seattle, the Washington State project, Microsoft funded, or Gates Foundation funded to create 180, 80 something courses for basic college, college courses and they wanted to publish versions of those in connections and they used the SWORD API command line to get all of this stuff done much faster than it would have been to do each of those using the user interface. And OpenStax College, another group producing a lot of content in connections, they're, they're doing these, this is the first five set of textbooks that are coming out and um, they did their development on a server so they could get the, they, they wanted to you know, publish the entire thing at once, so they did a lot of development on a server, and then they used the Sword API to move all of that content onto connections itself. Future uses that we're looking at um, empowering with this, um, there's a project in South Africa called Siavula, which ha it already has a lot of content in connections. They have a complete, kindergarten through ninth grade curriculum of workbooks, and that covers every subject. They also have a series of high school math and science textbooks that just last year got adopted countrywide. And um, they are building a business, a sustainable business around their open content. And right now, the stuff, their, their content that they're working on now, they're embargoing for a little while so that they can get um, kind of first mover, and they'll then want to publish all of that because they are doing uh, a format that's compatible. Anyway, so o uh, Sword and OER Pub would be a great way to get all of this content in once it's past the embargo. Um, we're hoping to work with BookType, which is a group that does floss manuals, so free uh, open source software manuals are produced with this software and we're looking at figuring out ways to make that content um, easily move between open repositories and the, the book type formats. Um, some of you may know Peer-to-Peer -peer University. Uh, that's uh, a, a, another global repository where you create courses and run those courses together to learn new materials as peers. And one of the things that happens is that if you have content and you want to reuse it, you really need a way to archive that content so that it can be um, reused and remixed. And so that's one of the things that we'd like to foster is being able to publish that to an open education repository from the open course, courseware and vice versa. And this is just a sample of showing you know, how that looks if we, if we take it right now through our current converter. Um, other places that would, you know, that, that SWORD and OER Pub could uh, facilitate would be something like um, Open University's lab spaces. Again, they have a format, they have the same kind of idea. They want this um, format, formatted structure. And they use OUXML, very, very closely compatible with the format that Connections uses, compatible with DocBook. Did a, you know, and we can now, by using these APIs, we can build tools that convert between formats and publish into different, different repositories, remix, reuse. Um, we are, you know, we're, we're a little bit of an odd fit because most people here are really thinking about archiving and preserving research data but we have some uses that really fit with that even within this open education space. We have professors creating textbooks that really is part of your scholar, scholarship, scholarly output. And um, their institutional repositories want the you know, version one of that textbook, version two of that textbook, they want that archive so we can easily use um, SOAR to deposit in both places. 
And uh, this is another person who started out as an author and became a graduate student and did research. So now you have this, you have research data about a body of work. You want to archive that in an institutional repository with the content as it was used in that research. And then finally, there are people pr producing journals using the same, same interface, the same repository. And so that really does fit perfectly into the institutional repository uh, framework where you want to be able to deposit in your institution. And um, there's our wall of fame so far, people who have worked on the project. We would love to get more people involved in any, any way possible. Um, and if you would like to stay involved, here's some further links, the links to this presentation, which has some other links in it, and me, my blog. I should put Marvin's email there, too. But he's all over the code once you get there. Thanks, Kathy. We, we have time for just a couple of questions before we have to uh, not vacate the room, but uh, ready the room for the uh, developer challenge show and tells, which will be coming. So uh, without any ado whatsoever, questions for Cathy. That made it sound like I didn't want any questions. I do want questions. <laughs> There's a gentleman over here. Hi, Tim Brody from University of Southampton. A really specific technical one, which is the um, what I would call a partial put. You know, you say you put. Oh, the merge. Yeah. yeah. My understanding is that you should be using a patch, but there is no defined mechanism for the data you send over patch. Because the trouble with put, if you overload it, then if a system doesn't recognize your header, you're going to nuke your existing data when you send your partial data over. So, sorry, a very, very specific question. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's a really good point. Um, I think when it gets right down to it, you know, I don't know that you're going to have clients that are super generic and don't know about the repositories. Like, I think probably it's our client working with a repository we know accepts that. I mean, it's, it's a good point. It's, it, it's potentially dangerous if something doesn't recognize that. We need to have some error that says, I didn't recognize the header rather than ignoring it and doing something you weren't expecting. Thanks. Other questions, comments for Kathy? Uh, well, I'll have the last word in that case. Uh, I was intrigued. You may have covered this already. I may have just missed it. But one of your lessons learned was uh, to avoid multiple ways uh, of specifying metadata. Uh, can I just ask which, what were the multiple ways which were in, in place and how you chose between them? So, so what we did was we, we took Dublin core fields and we added attributes to them. And then at the same time, we did a separate uh, one that was just its own, you know, like a, an element in our namespace. And that was a mistake. We should have just said, no, we'll go with Dublin Core with the attribute that tells you, like, for instance, contributor, we wanted to be able to do translator and editor and a connection specific one, which is called maintainer. And so we put those in our namespace. We shouldn't have done that because it, it definitely caused bugs. And then there were places where um, we can't do anything about it. Like I mentioned that, you know, you have the title in Adam and you have the title in the Dublin core, and you prob you might have the title in the XML that you're sending to. Yeah. So we just specified which one we were going to respect. Yeah. We couldn't really control that one. But at least under the ones that, that were under our control, we shouldn't have said two ways to do the <laughs> same thing. Well, you live and learn. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Final, final round of applause for, not just for Cathy, but for all of our speakers in this session. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Cathy. I've, I've two very short uh, things to say. One is that the uh, Developer Challenge show and tell will be in here starting in about five minutes' time. Uh, so go out, there's drinks in the, in the foyer, come get a drink. The other thing is that there have apparently been mixed signals about when uh, drinks and dinner uh, are served tonight at the museum. Uh, it's seven o'clock, drinks from seven uh, or half seven, and then food at eight. So get there early. Thanks very much. <laughs>